Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I am Orrin Eisner, the president of the Jeffrey M. Talpins Foundation. We are a leading partner in the Atlantic Council's work on Israel, including the N7 initiative to advance normalization between Israel and its Arab neighbors. I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers. We are fortunate to have with us Ambassador Thomas R. Nides, the U.S. Ambassador to Israel. Since taking up his position in Jerusalem last November, Ambassador Nides has been at the forefront of U.S. efforts to expand the Abraham Accords. Today's discussion will take a closer look at the Biden administration's prioritization of U.S.-Israel relations and the support for Arab-Israeli normalization at a time of global turmoil and regional political and economic transformation. We were very encouraged by the recent Negev summit that was held this past spring and are very excited uh, by today's reporting that President Biden may be soon visiting the region. Today's conversation will be moderated by the Atlantic Council's distinguished fellow um, and one of Ambassador Knight's predecessors in, in his role, Ambassador Dan Shapiro. As a reminder, today's event is on the record and will be recorded. Now allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Ambassador Thomas Nyes was confirmed by the Senate as the U.S. Ambassador to Israel this past November 3rd and presented his credentials to Israeli President Isaac Herzog on December 5th. Ambassador Nyes was most recently the Managing Director and Vice Chairman of Morgan Stanley. And before that was the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources. Ambassador Nyes' other positions in a truly impressive career include Chief Operating Officer of Morgan Stanley, Chief Executor Officer of Burson Marsteller, and Chief Administrative Officer of Credit Suisse. In the public sector, the ambassador served as Chief of Staff to the U.S. Trade Representative, Senior Advisor to Speaker of the House, and Senior Advisor to House Majority Whip. Moderating the conversation, we have Ambassador Dan Shapiro. Ambassador Shapiro served as U.S. Ambassador to the State of Israel from 2011 to 2017. Before being named Ambassador, he served as President Obama's Senior Director for the Middle East and Africa on the White House National Security Team and as President Obama's Senior Policy Advisor. Ambassador Shapiro most recently served as a Senior Advisor to the Special Envoy for Iran in the Biden administration, after which he joined the Atlantic Council as a Distinguished Fellow. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us this morning. It is an honor to have you here. And now I'll hand the floor over to our speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, Oren Eisner, uh, and my uh, sincere thanks to the Jeffrey M. Talpins Foundation, who you represent, our partner at the Atlantic Council uh, in all our work on our N7 initiative to deepen and expand normalization between Israel uh, and its neighbors. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, for your uh, partnership. Uh, I also uh, want to thank my very good friend, uh, Ambassador Tom Nides. Uh, you have been here for about five months. Uh, an incredibly active ambassador. You're just about everywhere. Uh, everyone in Israel knows you. Uh, you've become the key channel of communication between uh, the U.S. and Israeli governments. Uh, and uh, so we have lots of questions, uh, and I'm going to throw some at you. I also want to invite members of our audience to submit questions uh, over the course of the, uh, of the hour or so we'll have, uh, and we'll try to get to some of those in the latter part. Last thing I'll say just as a way of introduction is we're doing this uh, in the sort of final hour before Israel's Independence Day uh, comes in. Uh, so we'll end before the top of the hour. Uh, there's a siren that sounds to begin the uh, marking of that uh, day. Uh, we'll end about 10 minutes before the hour. And maybe before we end, I'll ask you to have some reflections on, uh, on the importance of, of that day. But let me jump right in, if you don't mind, uh, to uh, the issue that brought me to the Atlantic Council and the issue that really animates uh, our work in the N7 initiative, which is indeed to try to expand and promote uh, normalization. Uh, that's uh, going uh, at, a, at a very important tilt ever since the Abraham Accords were signed. And you have identified it as one of your personal priorities, one of the Biden administration, Biden administration priorities. So before we get into some of the specifics, I'd love to hear you describe uh, why it's a priority, how it benefits U.S. interests, and while I'm at it, uh, there's a report today by Barack Ravid and Axios that uh, President Biden might even meet with a group of Middle East leaders similar to the Negev summit when he comes in the weeks uh, or months ahead. Uh, you can say whatever you want on that report, but uh, the floor is open to talk about uh, why this is a priority and, and, and how you're working to advance it. Well, first of all, um, <laughs> I got a really good teacher uh, in Dan Shapiro and his wife, Julie, uh, both have uh, welcomed me with open arms when I got here. I have had... Uh, dozens and dozens of conversations with Dan uh, and his family to help me, guide me 
Uh, if I can only be a one tenth as a good ambassador <laughs> as you were, uh, I've done uh, a decent job because ultimately uh, you were here for a long period of time. Uh, you have have created a very difficult uh, road for me because I'm trying to be as good as you. No, it's no, very no. complicated to do. You're so I'm trying that. not to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to try to screw up more than you ever did. Uh, but it just, it's just, it's and I mean this in all sincerity, you know, it's very hard to, uh, have uh, people come in who've had your jobs. You've only been gracious to me uh, and helpful to me. And and I thank you, obviously. You're my friend and my pal. And obviously, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Listen, um, you know, I said on my confirmation hearing, uh, someone asked me, one of the senators asked me, said, well, is, is, the, is the Biden administration um, into or like or uh, considered to be engaged in the Abraham Accords. In fact, some one senator said, you guys won't even call it the Abraham Accords. I said, Senator, with all due respect, let me, re let me say one thing very simply. We respect and love the Abraham Accords. Let me remind you again, the Abraham Accords. And, and I have said since the moment I've got here that I am all about strengthening a democratic Jewish state. That is my North Star. Everything I do is about strengthening a democratic Jewish state. And there's nothing in my personal view that has strengthened that more uh, than the beginning of the Abraham Accords. And I give uh, the Trump administration uh, credit uh, for uh, creating uh, the momentum for it and, and, and developing it. And my view of this is of the Biden administration who is embraced this by the president and the secretary of state and the national security advisor and the whole uh, White House. Our job is to go uh, deeper. My job personally is to go deeper with the countries that we have. Uh, and the White House is to go wider, right? Uh, and to bring other countries into the floor. I mean, we talked about this Negev summer. I mean, it's remarkable. I, I can't even, if I told you how this thing came down, this was literally done in 48 hours. I got a call from uh, Lapid, uh, well, actually Lapid's guy, then Lapid Foreign himself, Minister, Foreign Foreign Minister. Minister uh, Lapid, uh, and said, I have an idea. Why don't we get all the foreign ministers to come to, to Israel to talk about the Abraham Accords? I said, guys, it's 48 hours. These usually take months to do, and then it never happens, right? Because you can't agree on this, agree with that. Not only did they do this, they came to the Negev, a desert hotel, and the Emiratis and the Moroccans, the Bahrainians, and then the Egyptians wanted to come, and the Israel, and, and Tony Blinken shows up and you know, as, as, as the prime minister likes to say, it's a beautiful thing. This was a beautiful mm. thing. They, you know, they talked about the Abrahams, they talked about peace and prosperity. So I'm, as a guy who um, uh, loves giving credit where credit is due, this is a, a phenomenal, uh, 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 not only opportunity, uh, but it, it just makes Israel a stronger democratic Jewish, Jewish state. It makes the region safer, uh, both economically uh, and politically, uh, and most importantly, uh, from a security perspective. So um, uh, as you know, I'm all in and I'm trying yeah. to continue to, to focus on the things I can do to make uh, the Abraham Accord stronger and more viable for the long term. Well, I appreciate uh, everything you, you said, but especially you're highlighting as kind of a bipartisan commitment. This is something that now crosses two administrations, both parties. It's got strong support, uh, both parties in Congress, and really stands uh, to be a, a long-term commitment by uh, our whole our whole government. Yeah, listen, and, and, I mean, again, listen, listen, obviously, uh, you know, I don't do politics anymore because I'm a diplomat, but hypothetically, probably most people know I'm probably a Democrat. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and there's not many, a lot of things I necessarily agreed with a lot of the former administration. This one, everywhere I go, I talk about the importance of it. Uh, I talk about the importance of the, the, that, this, that administration doing this, about the importance of uh, economic ties. It's really, though, interesting now, it's about the people, the people stuff that, that is the most single, most important yeah. thing, as you know. I, I did this event in the Emirates uh, four weeks ago where we took soccer players from uh, Bahrain, Morocco, uh, the UAE, uh, Israel, and we played uh, called the Abraham Cup. And, and, it, and we all went down, all the, all the tourism ministers went, the cultural ministers went down uh, to Dubai uh, for a day and a half. And then we brought chefs from all the countries. I know it sounds a little silly, but let me tell you something. That kind of stuff matters. And that's what this whole Abraham Court thing. I got on that plane from the from Ben Gurion uh, uh, to, to Dubai. It was packed with Haredi, with religious Jews, with non-religious Jews, 
it was like, I'm telling you guys, this is a spectacular uh, um, achievement. And we, our job as everyone is to, is to create momentum uh, to grow it and to deepen it. I saw you kicking the ball around a little bit. Yeah, on really the soccer well, I was field. scored uh, too. Yeah, I yeah. was, you know, I was making a move on the, uh, uh, time, towards me in, in, yeah. in uh, Israel, and I was trying to. The next time, take, take off your suit, put on some yeah, shorts. Suit looked, you know? It yeah. looked kind of ridiculous, uh, but I tried. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you mentioned these people to people initiatives that really you've championed uh, in sports and in culture. Uh, what are some of the other areas in business, in science and technology that you're involved in or you see as uh, really ripe uh, avenues for, for progress? Well, you know, what I did is we, we took the three ambassadors, um, Bahrain, Morocco, and the UAE. In the Israelis, and we um, assigned each of them different categories. One was um, uh, technology uh, and healthcare. One was uh, tourism, uh, and the other one was sports and culture. And the idea was each one of them would own a particular category, and we would try to like make different haze and different stuff on on this. The the things obviously on tourism tourism is is dramatically going up between Israel. Uh, um, in the UAE, we're trying to equally do that in Morocco and Bahrain, make sure all the, the ideas of promoting uh, tourism and trade activities. Healthcare is another piece of this, healthcare technology in particular. So we have a lot of working groups on healthcare technology. I'm trying to do something. Uh, I know this is going back to the soft stuff. I want to do a big gamers event here in the fall mm -hmm. where we get kids who sit around. I'm like, drives me kids very crazy my kids play these <laughs> stupid games but the gamers for because we we have to focus not on people that are my age and your age but this needs to seep down to the to the to the to the 16 year olds and 15 year olds and the 20 year olds because if you grow up feeling good about israelis and jews and you the israeli jews understand the what morocco and the relationship they had that morocco has had with the jewish community and with israel and bahrain and you you start creating that momentum You've just changed the conversation. Sure. You've changed the conversation and why it's important to have uh, regional stability. I've been on a couple of those flights from Tel Aviv to Dubai, uh, absolutely packed, and you hear a lot of Hebrew in the streets of Dubai. Um, what do you think are the prospects of seeing a similar flow of tourists from UAE, Bahrain, and Morocco to Israel? Uh, it was so meaningful to have the Negev summit with those foreign ministers coming to Israel. Uh, I don't think the, the tourism has quite caught up in that, at that, but what do you see as a I, Listen, and we've seen this massive spike. I mean, first of all, economic, the, the trade numbers are up six, 700%. We all know that. Um, but we are seeing a huge amount of uh, both Moroccan uh, and Emirati business leaders coming here and tourists coming here. You know, they, it's, you got to get better. You got to get them into the old city. Obviously, there's desire for them to go up the Temple Mount. There's a, there's a lot of things that, that the system needs to catch up to. But I think it's, 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 it's now cool to do it. It's now interesting to do yeah. it. Now it's like, let's take the family on a trip to Bahrain. It's not, wasn't something natural or you're a Ukrainian, let's go to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem uh, for the weekend. So I think that that momentum is coming. Some of this is going to be natural. Some of this is going to be, you have to create the momentum, but again, not to be that guy, but it is at the end of the day, it's about security and, and the security cooperation between these countries and making the region safer as it relates to issues around you know, I'm sure we'll get into Iran, but just generally, obviously, there's a lot of bad actors out there. And the more that this, the, the Abraham Accord countries can be collective on, on security issues, working with, uh, uh, working with the, with DOD and the IDF and CENTCOM and, and uh, AFCOM, and continue that momentum, I think it'll keep the whole region quite safe. Absolutely. Or safer. Uh, you know, so I get asked all the time, well, who's next? You know, what's the next country to come? And of course, everyone always focuses on Saudi Arabia. I'm not going to ask you to reveal any, you know, uh, uh, sensitive communications, but how do you describe the administration's strategy to do that broadening to, to include more countries into this, uh, into this uh, trend? Uh, listen, I don't think it's lost in anyone that I think ultimately, wouldn't it be great that Saudi Arabia had normalized relationships with Israel and Israel with Saudi Arabia, would that be great? Sure. How, and, and, and Kuwait uh, and, the, and, the, and, and cut the whole region, would that be great? Absolutely, it would be great. And again, I, I, the, we've got to create the momentum. Every one of these is difficult to do. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, our view of this is more the merrier. Uh, we got to show the benefits to the other countries of why it's important to to normalize with Israel, mm. to have a, a, a relationship with, with Israel. It's in our job as, 
I guess the United States is the is the bridesmaid or the <laughs> or the matchmaker, uh, and we got to keep that matchmaking ability. And it's hard; it's not easy. And I give the Trump administration credit because each one of these countries want something uh, from us, and we want something from them, and they want something from the Israelis. This is this is not for the faint-hearted. This right. this little maneuver is not faint-hearted. But again, I think it's well worth the time and the energy. And by showing momentum, by showing success, by showing economic success, people to people success, I think it creates the momentum to do this in a bigger, broader way. And again, I'm going to leave the smart people in, in Washington uh, to focus on this. It's interesting. Uh, I think it's been uh, known publicly. Um, I'm thrilled that uh, uh, our mutual fund uh, friend, uh, uh, Michael Ratney, is, mm-hmm. it was nominated and hoped to be confirmed as, a, as the next uh, ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, he's a good friend of both of ours. He was, uh, he's been here in Israel uh, and I'm, uh, you know, that's great. Yeah. No, he'll be a great partner. And uh, the sooner he's confirmed and I, the, the better, the better. So obviously one of the uh, issues that's uh, sort of always a challenge around this uh, is the uh, Palestinian reaction, which has been fairly negative to normalization. Um, they of course were at the Negev summit, uh, although the issue was clearly discussed, it was mentioned by several of the foreign ministers and their remarks. You know, I'm of the view, and I imagine you share it, that uh, this doesn't need to be a negative. This can be something from which Palestinians can find they have improved conditions and improved opportunities if it's harnessed and, and, and directed in the correct way. Um, and uh, maybe even over time, it can even lower the barriers to uh, renewed Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and even progress toward a two-state solution. So how would you make that case if that's how you feel or how would you describe it? And how would you make your case to Palestinians about what's the possibility that there's an actual benefit for their interests, both on sort of the personal, but also on the, on the, on the national level. Well, you and I share the same view, which is um, the more the Palestinians are engaged in the benefits of anything, okay, it's just a step back. When, when the Biden administration took, uh, uh, came into, uh, got elected and came into office, um, we immediately dramatically increased the economic benefit to the, to the Palestinian people. Um, I think we're, I think this year we're at about $450 million. This is for uh, education, healthcare, uh, for the Palestinian people. And, and part of that idea was, is, you know, we want to keep the vision, the vision of a two-state solution alive. I think it's important, again, if my North Star is a strong democratic Jewish state, I fundamentally believe to do that and to sustain that is to have people believe in their heart that there is still an opportunity for a two-state solution. So given that as the, the context of this, you know, obviously we would love to have, or certainly uh, the United States and hopefully other parties would love to have the Palestinians benefit from the Abraham Accords. Listen, this is a complicated region. A lot of people don't like each other. There's arguments all the time. There's slights that happen. So, but ultimately, if, if, if Israel, through the work of the United States, has been able to do what they have done vis-a-vis um, this regional cooperation, there is always room uh, for the Palestinian, and most importantly, for the Palestinian people. Uh, you know, we can you, people can debate about the PA uh, and, and all that, like all governments, but I care about the Palestinian people. I want them to get the benefits from, you know, uh, more access to travel, um, education opportunities, health care, um, opportunities for their kids. And I think hopefully over the long term, They'll benefit from something like the Abraham Accords and other opportunities. And again, listen, at the end of the day, our job is to create an environment that people say, okay, I want to be part of it. So my view of this is um, uh, I'm, I'm, we, I spent a lot of time thinking about how we can help uh, the Palestinian people. Uh, clearly getting them engaged in the benefits of the Abraham Accords is something that we should all work towards. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you feel like that's a priority that's shared among uh, the countries that are around this table at the negative summit or something else, or it kind of varies from country to country. Kind of, hey, listen, you know this as well as I do, and you know the answer as well as I do. <laughs> uh, but I, listen, I do. A, I think every country has their different views of what their priorities are. Uh, listen, it's a priority for the United States, uh, which is very important. Again, uh, being the matchmaker, we're constantly uh, pushing uh, the idea. Uh, other countries have, uh, feel strongly about it. Other countries, not so much. Uh, but I think, listen, at the end of the day. Um, we, we can control what we can control. Mm-hmm. We can cr- create the momentum, the press attention, the trade opportunities, uh, the, the security cooperation, 
Uh, they, if people see the benefits of being part of it, they, they want to be part of a club. This is like a club. Mm -hmm. You want to be a member of the club? It's an exclusive club. Uh, and we got to show, and, we, and the good news is we're part of the membership committee. Okay. <laughs> so we want to continue making sure that the membership keeps growing and flourishing. So that's our job. Uh, as, as certainly, I believe it's one of my jobs as the American ambassador. I can certainly speak for the Secretary of State uh, and, the, and the, those in, the, in Washington. And listen, the Israelis have every benefit and every desire to have it grow. Yeah, spoken like the son of a temple president. Exactly. As a, exactly. <laughs> and the head of the UJ. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, of course, the last month uh, with the confluence of the holidays, Ramadan, Passover, Easter, uh, uh, not unsurprisingly, has been a bit tense. Uh, in the area in, in Jerusalem, uh, you and your colleagues in the administration have been uh, intensely focused even before it began on how to uh, avoid and minimize and obviously ease those tensions once they began. Uh, how do you think it sits right now and, and what's been the administration's role and strategy in, in trying to deal with that? Challenge? Well, as you know, and many people on the, uh, who are watching this know, this was a conflict of events that happened this year. As you know, I think every approximately every 30 years, uh, Ramadan, Easter and Pesach all fall in the same period of time uh, because the lunar calendar, it creates the, that process. Uh, and that was it this time, right? And to be honest with you, we were pretty nervous. You know, uh, we spent a lot of time before this meeting with all the parties between the, the Palestinians uh, and uh, the Israelis and the Jordanians, the Egyptians and all the different pieces trying to keep things calm, uh, try to keep things, you know, on the, on the Temple Mount, calm and allow uh, the, for uh, for the Muslims who want to go to the Temple Mount and pray uh, that they had the ability to do that uh, in safety and security. You know, I will give you know I want to give the Israelis a, a lot of credit. I think things went uh, you know pretty well. I mean, it wasn't perfect; nothing's perfect. But given the confluence, I'm telling you, I, I you know I spent a lot of time talking with the Prime Minister, uh, with the Defense Minister with the security ministers, you know, they really, really tried, really tried to keep this uh, as, as peaceful as possible. Again, never perfect, but I think, you know, I think on Thursday or Friday, 250,000 people, I think we're up Temple Mount. It's a lot of people. And I just, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I feel really good about what they did and how they did it um, again. Like everything, you can always learn lessons about how things went. So we got through this period of time. As you know, the year ago, the results of this period of time weren't so good. As you recall, the Gaza war that took place following it, that did not happen this time. Uh, so I give all the parties and I give, you know, uh, a President Boss a, a credit as well from calming things down and, and, and working to keep things calm. Um, and so I think ultimately um, we got through this, uh, we got through this month uh, in a pretty good place. And I give a lot of people a lot of credit for making it happen. Well, I know it was uh, in, uh, this product of intense work by you and your colleagues. So uh, well, thank listen, you. I should tell you, and, and, and our, our folks in Washington State Department came, flew down here uh, last week uh, uh, and uh, really went and went to the region and talked to the region about what was going on. So the combination of Hattie and Yale coming here and doing the things they did mm -hmm. also were enormously important to mm -hmm. the success of of uh, this month. How has, uh, how has Jordan been affected by this? It's always, uh, meds in Jerusalem are always uh, very sensitive for the Jordanians. Yeah, listen, I, again, as you know, this region as well as I do, um, the, it, listen, the, the Jordanians were first among equals um, on normalization uh, with, uh, uh, with Israel, and that they're an important, important ally now the United States uh, to Israel. Their enormous sensitivity, as you know, uh, they are in, uh, uh, in control of the of the Temple Mount, the the walk, as you know, is the is the secure quote security operation. Uh, so they have lots of sensitivity when anything comes on there, and mm -hmm. they weren't shy of expressing that. Mm -hmm. But it, I think if you step back and look at the big picture and look how things were handled in totality, again, uh, I think, and again, I'm I'm pretty balanced in my views here. Uh, I think uh, we got through a very very tough month with a lot of cooperation and a lot of really uh, desires to let people uh, spend Ramadan, uh, spend Easter, and spend Passover in an exceptionally important time in people's lives, and and and, and, uh, and mostly uh, in peace, uh, and and in most cases in peace and quiet. Thanks. 
Uh, so you're getting a lot of the highlights of an ambassadorship. You've got a presidential visit now announced and uh, coming forward. We might come back to that a little bit uh, at the end. Um, uh, there's already a, a coalition crisis, or I don't know if it's a crisis, but maybe a coalition wobble uh, in the Israeli government uh, with uh, one member's withdrawal, so there's not necessarily a majority in the coalition. Uh, so people are talking about the prospects of new elections and, and that could happen. I know you're not going to get into domestic Israeli politics, but as you think about uh, the, uh, particularly our, our focus on the Abraham Accords, uh, the, the, the process, the progress that's been made through the two Israeli governments. It started under Netanyahu, it's continued under Bennett and Lapid. Um, how could those relationships be affected if Israel is gonna go through a period of uh, political transition, elections, uncertainty, and then having to settle into a new government? What, what's your, what's your uh, crystal ball tell you? Well, first of all, let me step back. Um, uh, you should have told me how complicated this job is before I took it. <laughs> I, I should, did tell I you. I should have gone to France. Not that I was offered France, but I could have. <laughs> I could have pushed a little harder. Uh, um, uh, and listen, and one of the other really interesting things you forgot to mention to me is how much everyone cares about this place. I mean, I knew it intellectually, and I had been here many, many, many times, and have been involved in Jewish causes for a long time. But until you have seventy-eight members of Congress visit you in five months, <laughs> and everyone who's given four dollars or four shekels to the UJ who want to come here, uh, the reality is, is everyone cares. And obviously, this president really cares. This president uh, refers to himself as a Zionist. Uh, he's been here multiple, multiple times. Um, obviously, you know, a presidential trip is a big deal. You can organize around it. So ultimately, once those dates get settled, uh, I think he, again, is he is not uh, he is very familiar with the terrain. And that will be, you know, it's a pain in the end for the rest of us to try to organize these. But of course, I hope no one's listening to the White House, but it's a delight. Just <laughs> He's to, really happy to have you a, come, Mr. Delight. President. Please come as much and often as you want. But but uh, and then I think, listen, I, I think um, and I see this with great sincerity. I, I really uh, respect this government. OK. Um, you know, I didn't know um, uh, Bennett, uh, I, I, you know, Prime Minister Bennett, I, I'd met uh, the foreign minister a few times, I'd met uh, the defense minister a few times, but I had, really hadn't worked with this group of people. Uh, this is, an, as a Jew, as an American Jew, looking at this, this, this um, government with, with Bennett is considered center right, with Lapid center, with Gantz, you know, center, center right. Uh, and then you have Mansour Abbas. You get the first Arab in a co in a governing coalition. It's it's remarkable. And you have like Minister Shikat, who's more on the right, and you've got the, the combination of merits and labor. It's something else. Yeah. It's something else. And 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 it's working. It's working. And you know, I again I don't get involved in domestic politics, but we as the United States uh, have a strong, strong working relationship with these guys. Uh, and obviously. Uh, that makes this relationship, this unbreakable bond between our countries, even stronger. So I, I have been, uh, I've been not only pleasantly surprised, but, but um, uh, really uh, uh, anxious and thrilled to work with them because they really do want to do the right thing in a difficult situation, which they have obviously in a, now a 60-60 uh, coalition. But uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a big fan of, of the government and uh, we you know, hope to continue working with them. That's great. Um, so I'm now six or seven weeks removed from uh, the work I was doing, advising our special envoy on Iran. So I'm really out of it now. Don't have any inside information, which is great. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to pump you for inside information, but I am going to ask you, you know, it does appear that the uh, Iran nuclear talks seem kind of stuck. And the reports are that it's around this issue of uh, the Iranian demand to remove the uh, Iranian Republican Guard. IRGC from the uh, list of foreign terrorist organizations and uh, President Biden isn't going to do that. And at least that is where the reports are that the talks stand. So again, without revealing you know, what can't be revealed, but uh, tell me a little about your conversations with the Israeli government uh, on these Iran nuclear talks, uh, what you think the prospects are with or without an agreement uh, for uh, how we're all together with our allies going to deal with the challenge Iran presents? Well, you, you, as someone who has been engaged in these issues for a long time, you know exactly what I'm going to say, uh, <laughs> which is, first of all, um, regardless if we get uh, the, into the JCPOA 2.0 or not, uh, the, the commitment of this administration is to assure uh, Israel and our allies we will not stand by to let the Iranians uh, obtain a nuclear weapon. Again, remind you, we will not stand to let 
the Iranians get a nuclear weapon. That's the commitment of the administration and the president of the United States. We would like to get there by diplomatic terms. We've been very clear about that from the get-go. We believe it's in the best interest uh, of the world to get there by diplomatic terms. Uh, no deal is a perfect uh, deal, and I'm not going to get into histrionics and how we got here, uh, but it's clear to us that we'd like to try to do that. Um, it's also clear to us, and it's very clear to the Iranians, uh, we have conditions to get back into a, a, the nuclear deal. And we've been very clear, not directly, but indirectly, and I think Secretary Blinken was quite clear about uh, the Iranians, it's up to the Iranians. I think we've been uh, quite um, uh, clear about our views and our opinions, including on things like the IRGC or FTO uh, designation. Uh, and so listen, I, my, our hope is um, that we still can get back into this agreement uh, and we'll work towards uh, achieving that. Uh, you know, we have a question from an audience member that, that is a good follow-up to this, which is, how uh, central do you think the Iran challenge is to the progress that has been made and can yet be made on the Abraham Accords and normalization? Some people have described this as a kind of an anti-Iran coalition uh, that's uh, coalescing and that that's how uh, that's what binds these countries together. Other you put a lot of emphasis on the people to people and the business opportunities. What's the connection that you see between the two? Listen, I, I think it just makes us all better and safer. Listen more members of the club. As I mentioned, the membership club is growing and there is a commonality with a lot of these members of this club. They don't particularly like Iran. And, you know, everyone's got their different views about how much they don't like Iran or how much they're threatened. They may not be threatened by Iran itself, but they're certainly threatened by its proxies. You ask the Emiratis about the Hutus and who's funding them, right? It doesn't take much imagination to understand. They don't like that very much, okay? And you look at Bahrain and Morocco, you know, they, they're, they're, everyone's got a different view of, 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 of what are their threats are, both economically and security wise. So as far as we're concerned, you know, uh, the, the club, Iran may not be the first issue of the club, but it's certainly on the list. And the more we can co co has coalesce, coalesce around um, those issues, the better off we are vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the threats that Iran, and as importantly, the proxies of Iran do to threaten um, uh, the legitimacy of many of these uh, countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, another uh, audience question, which uh, now pulls us a little bit away from the region, but uh, something you obviously have been having to deal with pretty much daily uh, for the last three months uh, is about Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and how uh, you know the Israeli government has uh, chosen to respond to this crisis, uh, the support it gives Ukraine, the attempt it makes to try to retain some channels of communication uh, with the Russian government. Uh, are we aligned uh, with Israel on this? Are we coordinated? Uh, do we have any critique or any requests or any uh, differences in our approach on this? Uh, we're totally aligned. I mean, listen, uh, the, the communication between the state of Israel uh, and the White House, either vis-a-vis -vis through me or directly, is lockstep along the way. I mean, on Ukraine in particular, Bennett was in constant contact with the White House, with President Biden and with Jake Sullivan as it relates to any of the discussions he was having with Putin. They became, I don't think they were particularly necessarily came to uh, take any great conclusions, but important. Uh, the Israelis have leaned in on the humanitarian uh, actions that they have taken, including setting up one of the first field hospitals in Kiev. In fact, I was uh, in the bunker uh, with uh, the foreign minister Lapid and Secretary Blinken and, and did a live feed into the, uh, into the uh, hospital, the field hospital in Kiev. Um, they're providing uh, different equipment. I mean, helmets and vests, which you've read about. Um, they've taken um, tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees that are coming here. Um, so I listen, we feel very good about the relationship and what uh, Israel. Listen, Israel does have unique issues too, and we're well aware of it. As you know, uh, those of you who are students of the map, uh, you know that um, they have Russia on their northern borders. Uh, they need to deconflict with Russia, or at least have been, as it relates to Israel taking uh, action um, uh, into Lebanon um, to, de to get to Hezbollah. And so there's a lot of deconfliction. So they've traditionally had a, a somewhat decent relationship to 
till Lazarov was making some insanely stupid comments. Uh, uh, but the reality of this is that the, the, the context of um, the relationship with us vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, uh, we're in constant contact. We feel very comfortable uh, on uh, Israel's position vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and what they're doing. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's uh, outrageous uh, comments uh, uh, blaming Jews and Israel for the Holocaust and, and, and really making all sorts of wild anti-Semitic accusations. Um, does that end even the ability for Israel and Russia to have the kind of uh, deconfliction and, and sort of, a, a, you know, normal, nominal diplomatic channel? It's not like a guy who's losing the war. Okay. <laughs> uh, so listen, I, listen, again, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give it credibility. It was so outrageously and stupid that I can't, it's, it's, it's remarkable to me. And, and so I think ultimately the actions of what, what, the, what Russia has done has set Russia back in my humble view, not only with Israel, but for the world for 30 years. I mean, it literally it just, it just knocked them back in the eyes of people and generations of kids uh, and companies and, and how people think of, of Russia. I mean, beyond just the massive death toll that they have done in Ukraine and among their own citizens, when, they're, when their own citizens wake up and realize what this has cost them, when they get through all the propaganda and they wake up and realize, you know, tens of thousands of soldiers have died, the economy is in, in terrible shape, and they're basically been embarrassed on the world stage. I think ultimately, um, you know, we'll see how they look vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the world, but I'm you know, obviously, I, my heart breaks for this. I yeah. I was honored to go to uh, to for Passover to be a, uh, to go to uh, President Herzog's home. There's uh, 13 or 14 of us there, and his kids, and his wife, uh, this president, and we had a Ukrainian. He had a Ukrainian family there. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 mother and two of his kids, uh, the kids, and their they left. Their husband wanted to stay back and fight. And these are these are this is she had a small business in uh, Kiev, like a jewelry store. These are when you think about re refugees, you have this vision of who refugees are. This is just like any of this could have been any one of us watching this. That's what these people were. And they're we're sitting at dinner and she's telling us the story about how she had to basically take three buses, walk for four miles. Luckily, her one of someone took her baby and held her baby and walked. I mean, and then and then she's left her husband to fight. It's it's it is. It's absurd. It's it's terrifying. It's horrifying. And you know, I, you know, I the what what the Russians have done for for whatever reason they've done it is is beyond any uh, imagination. And and the world um, should do what they're doing, which is um, come together. One thing is certain: uh, the Russians have created the momentum to strengthen NATO, to strengthen the world. And, and combination of what yeah. they've been doing. Well, through you, uh, I want to pass you know my respect to the whole administration, from the president to the secretary of state on down, for how I think uh, very, very smartly and shrewdly they've handled the uh, real challenge of ensuring Ukraine has what it needs to support, the holding that alliance together, uh, and also avoiding escalations that none of us want to see happen. Listen, I, listen, you know, I mean, I, listen, President Biden and and Tony Blinken and. Je and uh, Defense Minister Austin and, the whole, and Jake Sullivan, the whole team. This, this is this this is will, history will be written. I think will history will be written. It will certainly will history will be not be particularly good uh, to Russia and Putin. I think history will say United States played a leading role in bringing the world together uh, to try to solve what is arguably one of the biggest tragedies certainly the biggest refugee tragedy we've seen since World War II, and probably one of the most complicated military situations this country has faced. So I'm, uh, I give, like you, share um, uh, the admiration of what the administration has been able to pull up. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a number of spinoffs of the Ukraine crisis in the Middle East. Uh, there's uh, talk of a food crisis because the Ukraine and Russia are big wheat producers and men uh, produces price spikes. Uh, one of the other uh, spinoffs may have to do with uh, how the United States and Russia are perceived in the region. One of the things, and this is an audience question, that, that sometimes is behind, seems to be behind things like the Negev summit, is, a quest, is, is answering the question that Israelis and the Gulf Arabs tend to ask is, is the United States committed to the region? Is the United States withdrawing from the region after the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? How do you answer these questions about uh, United States commitment, its staying power, 
uh, how we contribute to this coalition of, of our partners, uh, and maybe even contrasting to Russia, who at times people also have, at least until Ukraine, looked to as a possible partner. Listen, I, again, this is always seems to be the one of the questions. Are, are, this is I put this in the same category as the Biden administration committed to the Abraham Accords, okay? <laughs> um, listen, the reality of this is there is a reason why we we're at the forefront of every action, right? We were at the forefront working with the Israelis. You asked Israeli who their most important ally is, who the who is going to work with them every day to, to keep, create the security blanket that Israel. Listen, they can protect themselves, but it certainly doesn't hurt to have the United States got their back. They'll obviously say the United States. When you look around the region, who wants to be part of the club? What they're asking: What is the United States going to give us to be part of the club? What are we going to be? How are we going to benefit? Uh, from this club. There is not a, a, a country in the Middle East, barring the ones we want to have relationships with, that don't value relations with the United States, both our hard power and our soft power. And we can't, we can't misjudge that because it, it, some people value our question of, you know, do you take this military action? Do you threaten this country? Do you do all those? But there's a lot of stuff about uh, our soft power, our assistance that we give, uh, how we help governments grow, how we present them on the world stage. So I'm, listen, I, I would like to wake, wake up and say we're disengaged. We'd make my job a lot easier. <laughs> every single hour of every single day, the United States is engaged not only in the Middle East. Tom Friedman used to say, you may not want to deal with the Middle East, but the Middle East wants to deal with you. I don't know if he actually said that, but it sounds everyone kept telling me Tom just said that. The reality is that it's a truism. And this and this president, as you know, is an expert. You know, he's he's spent his lifetime in the world of foreign affairs as a chairman, as the vice president, now as the president. He knows more about this region and the conflicts and the history than probably any president maybe ever, if you really want to think about it. So I'm, 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 I'm quite confident that uh, we're engaged and engaged fully. So if I had to uh, predict uh, a great power rivalry that would have been uh, a major part of your uh, work with the Israeli government, it wouldn't have been about Russia. Uh, it would have been about China. And even though the headlines, of course, are all about Russia and Ukraine, uh, in the background, we know that uh, the United States and China are uh, major competitors. Uh, China has interests in the region. China has uh, a relationship, economic relationship of di different character with Israel and with some other neighbors. Um, characterize, if you can, uh, your dialogue with the Israeli government about uh, the U.S.-China challenge and uh, what we seek from Israel and what opportunities Israel can still have uh, in that relationship, even while tending to concerns we raise. Listen, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, the foreign ministry, with the prime minister, with the national security advisors here about um, the role they need to play vis-a-vis -vis China. We, this, is, this is a sovereign country. Israel is a sovereign country. They can do, we can't tell the Israelis what to do, but they have been very forthright about um, that, what they need to do and what they need to do, given the fact that they're a leader in dual technology, dual use technology. So just the idea of their IP and where that IP ends up and whose hands it ends up in, um, they're quite conscious to make sure that they're doing, uh, doing the right things as, as, uh, um, tenders for, for privatization of different um, items in this country are put up to forbid. They're conscientious, not, you know, they want to do what's in the economic best interest for the country, but they're conscientious of making sure there's a process of vetting. Um, they're very open to these conversations. And I think to arguably, uh, we feel quite comfortable with it. Listen, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And we were at the game before the Israelis were at the game and Israelis have um, technologies that even the United States don't have. And so we're continually having those conversations. So we'll listen, um, we feel pretty good that the, that the Israelis are putting together and continue to add to their already robust processes, more processes to make sure uh, things are getting into the right hands at the right time. Great. Well, I promised uh, you and I promised our viewers that we're going to uh, conclude a little bit before the top of the hour to make sure that uh, you're able to uh, properly observe and uh, anybody uh, involved in this, uh, the beginning of the Memorial Day. Um, this is your, your first time in, uh, as ambassador being in Israel for Memorial Day and then immediately after that, uh, Independence Day, Yom Zikaron, Yom Ha'atzmut. If, if you could reflect a little bit on uh, what you have already learned about how this, uh, these days resonate with Israelis, how they resonate for you personally, how we as Americans as Israelis, Israel's allies uh, should relate to those uh, important moments. Well, listen, um, you know, uh, just think about this for a minute. Um, 
this country is 74 years old. That's not very old. Pretty, pretty impressive. You know, it's, it's a military superpower. You know, it's, uh, it's an economic powerhouse. It's an intellectual masterminds. Uh, it's got, and it's a thriving democracy. 74 years, you know, and remember how this country was created in the first place, coming out to go there. And it came to me in a, in, in a full circle, you know, as you know, um, uh, the country faces a lot of conflicts, including um, some recent terrorist attacks. Um, and I made a decision to go to the shivas of the last 14 or 15 people that have been unfortunately killed in terrorist attacks. That's tough duty. It wasn't about, you know, it's, you know, I'm not very good at this. You're probably much better than I am. You know, you don't, you just by showing up is important, but, but it, it struck me. I went to, you know, I went to this, um, one of the first one, uh, families I went to was in Beersheba, which is in Southern Israel. And I walked into the house and there was a young medic there in a uniform, a medic uniform. I asked him, you know, what's his connection? And he said to me, I, you know, I went to the, went to the scene. There was a stabbing. I went to the scene and I, and I, um, the woman was on the ground and clearly she'd been stabbed and clearly was dying. And he took off her mask and it was his aunt. Okay. Like, wow, God, this country is small. And then I, and then I went up, I went up north to, to Nazareth, which as many of you know, is predominantly um, Arabs. Um, you know, 20% of, of Israel is Arab. And I, and I sat with this father holding his hand and he was explaining to me that his son who was late twenties, I think he had a Jewish girlfriend that he was a police officer. And, and when, when they heard the call, he went to the scene of the, of the, of the shooting and he uh, sadly got killed, but the father didn't believe his father had been a police officer as well in Tel Aviv and was one of the, one of the officers who had been protecting early in his career, the U S embassy. Hmm. And he says to me, um, I didn't think it was my son because my son told me he was never going to ride a motorcycle again because he had been in an accident. And the news said that the kid, the person who got killed was on a motorcycle. And I thought, I'm okay. You know, there's an answer to this phone. And then an hour later, a knock on the door. But then I went to Tel Aviv and sat with two families who both son, both were the, the guys were best friends. And they were both in the same bar, just in Tel Aviv, about... 20 minutes from, the, from our, our, our consulate. And I, I was holding their one's fiance who had just gotten engaged to the kid three weeks ago, or three weeks earlier. The 27 year olds are my kid's age, my son's age is 27 years old. And I just, and I realized this is that, that this, this place is still fragile. It's still fragile. And I realize, and you, and you celebrate the memories of, the soldiers that died and the people that died, then obviously the, the, then the good news the next day or the day after the Independence Day. Uh, but I realized first how small this country is, still how vulnerable this country is. But more importantly, I think every family that I talked to had one theme, do not let the terrorists win. Don't let that very, very, very small percentage of people, very, very small, let it ruin it for everyone else, both for the Palestinians uh, and for the Israelis and for the Arabs who live in Israel. And so, so my only hope is on this, you know, holiday of, of remembrance uh, and, and independence that we remind ourselves how, 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 although how great this country is, as young as it is at 74 years old, it's still somewhat vulnerable. And we have to keep our minds, all of us need to keep on and bringing it back to things like the Abraham Accords, make it stronger. But What's really makes this country stronger is the is the will of this country to fight and to work and to make this a better place. Uh, that's a, a very profound and inspiring note to end on, uh, Ambassador Tom, my friend. Uh, you're uh, you're an outstanding ambassador. You're a mensch. Uh, you're a great diplomat, and uh, very very much appreciate you doing this with us. Not bad for a kid from Duluth, Minnesota. My second favorite product of Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah, his wife was from Duluth. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And I want to thank all uh, of you who joined us. Uh, please stay tuned. There will be a lot more from the Atlantic Council of Police programs and our N7 initiative uh, on Israel and on prospects for expanding normalization. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye.